very good evening to all of you. Uh, I just got home. If I had to uh, do few things, so sorry for the com uh, late commencement. At least because we have agreed that we have at least one hour every night. Let's keep to that commitment. So it is within that spirit that I have endeavored to be here, despite the fact that it's relatively late. So we are just going to make it uh, strictly uh, uh, 45 minutes, one hour, and then we are done and we continue uh, tomorrow. So we are continue with our discussion of uh, some of the past questions that we'll be having. And as I said, the purpose is for the things in the past question to provide some kind of like a, a platform for us to have a, a standard explanation on various uh, topics, like in sort of like a random fashion based upon how the questions are and the various options which are presented. So within uh, the context of that uh, understanding, uh, let's look at question 20, which is starting part of the uh, 2012 uh, uh, questions. Uh, so if you look at the 20, uh, the question is, the acceptance of an offer by email may be determined by reliance on Electronic Transactions Act 2008, Act 772. Uh, certainly, uh, this question uh, is from law of contract, uh, often acceptance, and it's quite specific about the Electronic uh, Transactions Act. And this is a, a type of question I'll call like the killer question. Killer question in the sense that uh, you either know or you don't know, because there's no uh, way by which you can guess. You know, that is uh, just like uh, what I tell my company law students is usually, uh, you know, since it's a, it's a statute, it's a, a particular provision, you either know it or you don't know it. So section 23, you know it or you don't know it, 18, 19, and all that. So we need to, uh, first of all, uh, remember uh, what the Electronic uh, Transactions uh, uh, Act uh, seeks to do. And uh, if you remember from your LLB days, uh, it's an attempt to uh, codify and clarify the principles which exist at common law with respect to what we call the instantaneous uh, uh, mode of communication. Uh, you know, the entire mouth far is cooperation type of cases. But 2008, our lawmakers made a bold attempt and came out with the Electronic Transactions Act 2008, Act 772. And uh, provisions of uh, this, uh, this act are very relevant to issues of uh, communication of uh, offer or communication of acceptance as uh, the case may be. So for example, if we take section 23 of the Electronic Transactions Act, it states that an agreement is valid even if it was concluded partly or in whole through an electronic means. So uh, 23 is endorsing the fact that where the medium by which the agreement was concluded uh, is electronic, it's still valid. It does not render the contract invalid. So that is the point about session 23. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, if you look at session uh, 18, uh, session 18, uh, it addresses the issue of a dispatch of an electronic record. Uh, in other words, when you transmit something electronically, uh, how does the law determine it? So let's go to the provision, which I have with me here. Uh, I think from Mrs. Zona Hammond's book, page 47, quote, unless otherwise agreed between the originator and the addressee, the dispatch of an electronic record occurs when it enters an information processing system outside the control of the originator or the agent of the originator. Good. 
sometimes you get the, a problem based question and uh you no know, it may the transaction might have taken place uh through uh emailing and things like that or even through a uh, telefax and all that and there may be confusion as to what time the acceptance was received and all that and this is where Section 18 of the Electronic Transactions Act 2008 Act 772 become handy that as a general rule, the critical time for determining when uh, electronic uh, record is said to have occurred or is said to have been communicated is when the information sent enters the information processing system outside the control of the originator. So, so long as the originator does not have the control, that's like maybe let's suppose that maybe like the email, you hit the send uh, button. And as soon as you hit the send button, it leaves your control. So you don't have control over it. So that is the kind of thing that is talking about. Of course, uh, one will tell me that uh, if you look at the uh, Gmail and all that, I think within uh, 30 minutes or so, you can uh, reverse it. Well, whatever the case, the most important thing to remember is that if you want to know when uh, you be considered as having sent the, let's say the, the acceptance or the offer or whatever through electronic means, the decisive time will be when it left uh, your information uh, retriever or info information uh, storage uh, system or processing system, meaning that it left a system that you do not have control, that you cannot even bring it back. So that is the, the point uh, being made. And, and, and that is why the determination will not be uh, uh, when you actually sent it but when it actually left uh, the information uh, processing uh, system. But let's look at the, the receipt. Uh, when can we say that uh, you receive the uh, transmission electronically? I'm just, of course, I'm sure you'll be wondering, uh, is postal rule applicable and all that? Certainly postal rule is not applicable here and this is, uh, an exception to the well-known uh, postal rule in Adams and Linsell and all that. So let's look at section 19 of the Act 772. Uh, section 19 deals with the receipt of electronic uh, record and it states, the time of receipt of an electronic uh, record shall be determined as follows. A, if the addressee has designated an information system for the purpose of receiving electronic records, Receipt occurs at the time when the electronic record enters the designated information system, or B, if the addressee has not designated information uh, system, receipt occurs when the electronic record enters an information system of the addressee through which the addressee retrieves the electronic uh, record. In other words, if you want to know the time uh, in which an electronic communication was received. The decisive moment will be when it actually entered the information system of the, the recipient. And therefore, if you have designated a particular, uh, maybe system for maybe for receiving uh, electronic communication, then the, the time that it entered that particular system that was designated will be like the decisive time. That is the point. Now, now we have an idea of what session 23 says. We have an idea of what session 18 says. And then we have an idea regarding what session 19 is saying. So let's get back to the question. The acceptance of an offer by email may be determined by reliance on the Electronic Transactions Act 2008. Uh, what is the answer? Let me look at the chat. What is the answer? 
What is the answer? Yes, I put it in the chat. Uh, okay, so we have two competing answers, D and C, D and C, okay. We very soon determine which one is correct. Okay, so uh, we have two groups of uh, respondents. One group is saying that the answer is C, the other group is saying that the answer is D. Uh, C is about section 19 and then D, all of the above. Um, those who are saying all of the above, uh, okay, let's look into that. Now the question is talking about acceptance of an offer by email. Uh, so acceptance of an offer by email, don't forget that session 23 uh, made the point that yes, it is uh, quite valid for a contract to be made uh, partly or uh, fully uh, through an electronic medium. So that is what 23 is saying. And then the 18, if you remember, is also talking about uh, when we can say that an electronic uh, communication has been uh, sent, uh, the time for determining it. So, uh, is that ringing a bell? Acceptance, communication of acceptance. Okay, let's look at the 19. The time of receipt of an electronic record. So the 19 de determines, like they'll give guidelines for determining uh, when uh, we can say that you've received uh, the particular electronic record. So in that respect, uh, D will be more uh, uh, suitable the reason uh, being that if we look at uh, all the provisions, uh, 23, 18, 19, in one way or the other, they are all uh, uh, relevant. Let's say the 18 talks about the fact that yes, you can have a contract partly or wholly through electronic medium. And uh, that uh, encapsulates the idea of uh, acceptance. Then the 18 talks about when you sent the information and 19 talk about when you receive it. So uh, in determining the acceptance of an offer by electronic mail, it may be necessary for us to know uh, when it was sent and then when it was received. And don't forget that it is not yet uh, you know, taken for granted or settled as to whether the postal rule of uh, acceptance actually applies the tonic, uh, to, to email. And for that matter, we cannot assume that Adams and Linzer uh, principle, which says that once we have sent the acceptance uh, in the usual way, acceptance is deemed to have been communicated, even if it does not get to the, if it does not get to the offeror that does not apply uh, to email. And the, the, the relevant uh, law is what we have in the electronic transaction. And on that score, uh, one will argue that uh, D, I then is a, a appropriate, is the most suitable answer in my view. Unless those who are opting for C would like to argue their point for us to hear. So see, will anybody like to argue? Uh, yes, will anybody like to explain why he thinks the C is the answer? Okay, we didn't get the C people to defend the answer. Okay, let's look at question 21. At common law, a promise to waive or forego uh, debt or part payment of a debt is not binding on the promisor unless there is some fresh consideration flowing from the promise. Which section of the Contract Act 1925 has modified this rule? Yeah, so that's a, another uh, a killer uh, question in the sense that 
you either know it or you don't know it. I'm talking about uh, the question which usually require you to uh, state a particular section of a provision. But before we come to uh, look at the answer, you all remember very well uh, the rule in the uh, Pinellas case. And the rule in the Pinellas case uh, as applied in folks and beer is what has been stated here that uh, if a person has made a promise uh, to waive or forgo a debt or part of it, that promise is not binding unless fresh consideration has been provided. So that is a classic statement of the rule in the Pinellas case of uh, Fuchs and Beer. And as we know, the contract hat of Ghana, uh, 1960 at 25, has modified or changed uh, that rule and to the effect that where a promise has been made to forego a debt or part of a debt, it is binding, whether or not uh, no consideration has been uh, provided. And which provision of the Contract Act uh, speaks to that? Let me take your answers and see. And this is why I want everybody to get it correct because it's so common. Uh, oh no, you're not answering. Okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, so I'm in session A2. That is B. Yeah, so the answer is B. Uh, okay, but uh, you remember uh, uh, session eight one. Session eight one uh, is the rule which modifies the uh, what they call the the principle in the Rutledge and grants or Dickinson and Doss, uh, which says that where someone has promised to leave an offer open uh, for a stated period of time. The promise is not binding unless it's supported by consideration. That is what uh, Rutledge and Grant or Dickinson and Doss uh, uh, states that as a common law position. But our law makers, uh, Section 8, Subsection 1 of the Contract Act, uh, they have modified that. And the position of the law is that where a promise has been made to uh, leave an offer open for a stated period of time. That promise is binding, whether or not uh, the no consideration is uh, provided by the promisee or the intended of array. So that is section eight one. After section eight two, you've already seen that uh, that is the modification of the rule in the penal case. Simply saying that a promise to uh, waive a debt or forgo part of a debt is binding, whether or not, uh, even where no, even where there has been no consideration by the the debtor, it's still binding on the creditor. Uh, then uh, session nine, session nine uh, is a modification of uh, the principle of consideration as stated in the case of uh, Collins and Godfrey. Uh, Collins and Godfrey, if you remember, the case of Collins and Godfrey is to the effect that where you perform a public act or public duty or official uh, uh, duty or a duty enjoined on you by law, that is not a sufficient consideration. That is not a good consideration. That is Collins and Godfrey. Remember the guy who uh, was promised by another person that should he go and testify, uh, the, he'd be given a reward. He testified and later on he was not given and then he sued. And then the court said that having been subpoenaed, having been subpoenaed, having been summoned by subpoena, you had a legal obligation. And if you did not go, you could be cited for contempt of court. So you've done something which is required of you under the law, and that is not a good consideration. Now that common law rule uh, has been modified by the provision in our contract act per section nine. Well, section nine says that where you perform a duty, uh, 
enjoined or by law or required by law, uh, it is still a good consideration. So that is modification of the rule in Collins and Godfrey. And again, uh, remember the uh, principle, uh, of course, related to uh, that. We also have where you perform like the uh, existing contractual duty. Can that uh, give rise to? Can that give rise to a sufficient consideration? And we know that. Uh, our lawmakers have once again uh, modified that, yes, if you perform a contractual duty, uh, that can also give rise to sufficient consideration. So just uh, on the same uh, uh, no, footing as the one that we have just uh, discussed. So I think that uh, all these things are necessary uh, for us to you know, recall so that when they decided to trick us. We'll be able to work our way to the correct uh, answer as it were. And of course, once we are with the Contract Act already, uh, what I would like to also uh, mention uh, quickly in passing is uh, what we call the, 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 the privity or the, 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 you know, the privity rule, which is important, uh, session uh, five, Session five one, session five one uh, is important. And remember that at, at common law, the privity rule, as we have it in the case of a Twaddle and Atkinson, is that uh, a, a contract does not create a, a right or a burden for a third party. That is the common law uh, position. And we, we saw how in the case of a Dunlop uh, pneumatic tie against suffrage, uh, how the House of Lords developed that, and they said that uh, in the laws of England, uh, there's nothing called uh, that a third party cannot have a right under uh, the contract uh, use a quasitum a tissue, or cannot have an obligation and all that. But uh, in session uh, five, our of contract act we have had like a modification uh, of that particular uh, principle. So that is like the, the contract uh, act position on privity of contract, meaning that in Ghana, where a benefit has been created for you under a contract, you can enforce the contract even if you are a stranger uh, to that contract uh, as it were. Okay, now we come to uh, a more general knowledge uh, type of question. Former President uh, Chastila was tried, convicted and sentenced by International Commission of Juries. International Commission of Juries uh, is certainly no, because uh, you remember international law, that is the, the body which is responsible for a systematic development of international law and whose work has resulted in the codifi codification of some of the uh, customary, uh, customary international law principles, such as the principles on the state responsibility and all that, and the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. So it's certainly not an uh, international convention of juries. It's not a court. Okay, let's look at that the, then. ICC. International Criminal Court at the Hague. Is that the, the court which uh, tried uh, Chastela? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, you want to find out whether the special prosecutor is coming. Uh, you hopefully uh, next week we will, you will get him. It's about availability. You see how we all struggle to make time to be here. He has expressed serious uh, enthusiasm to come and help. 
So we are hoping that uh, next, next week we're able to get him to come here. And then uh, Yanzo asking a question about what? A document on the homosexuality. Okay. Right, that, uh, that, 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 that will be sent. Yeah, I think that these uh, general questions, they don't have to uh, waste our time. These are some kind of like a what do you know uh, type of question. So let's move on to the more uh, legal ones. Which of these is usually referred to as the equities, darling? <laughs> this is bona fide purchase of an equitable interest, bona fide purchase of a legal interest, bona fide purchase of a value without notice, bona fide purchase of a value with notice. Okay, so I mean, this is uh, something that, uh, unless you are forgotten, it shouldn't get lost on any of us. Because the print, even when we're discussing, uh, those of you who watch my recording on mistake as to, you know, I mean, unilateral mistake as to identity of the other contracting party, we even mentioned that, and I also meet it in the land law and all that, is always bona fide purchaser for value without notice. Uh, so it's not bona fide purchaser of an equitable interest. No, there's nothing like that. Bona fide purchaser of a legal interest. No, we don't say that. Bona fide purchaser for value without notice. It's actually without notice. And then the defect of the title of the person that he uh, bought the thing from, or without notice of uh, a, a, a subsisting uh, uh, interest uh, as it were. And it's not bona fide purchase of value with notice, no. With notice of what? So it's always bona fide purchase uh, for value without notice. Then the law requires that a lease must be in writing unless A, it is an invitation to B, it is a term of less than three years C, it is a reversionary uh, list, and then D, it is a sublist. Okay, so uh, list, as soon as we see list, remember our landlord. And of course, you cannot say that uh, A is out. The law requires that list must be in right unless invitation to join, say invitation to what does it mean? You're asking somebody to come and make a deal or proposal, which you may accept or reject. So it doesn't really uh, make sense. Then B, it is for a term of less than three years. Okay, remember like the uh, the conveyancing uh, decree, which is repealed now by the the Land Act, and we I would suggest that if you haven't uh, started uh, reading the Land Act. Uh, 2020, I will uh, suggest that uh, you do so, especially uh, the modification which I've made to the customary land law uh, aspect. If you look at the act, uh, some modification have been made to what we know as the customary land law. In terms of like the, what the position was under the Land Registry Act and then the Land Title Registry, and even the uh, uh, Mortgages uh, uh, Act, not significant uh, uh, difference, but there will be like the slight modification of uh, customer land law principles. So I would like you to be reading that act. And I think that uh, in the coming uh, days, we will also focus on some uh, strategic aspects of uh, land law for purposes of uh, swift revision. So it is for a term of less than three years. Yes, uh, where that, that was the position and uh, that's the position where the lease is less than three years, then you are excused from the requirement that it should be in writing. See, it's a reversionary lease. No, uh, there's nothing like a reversionary lease. We have what we call a reversionary interest. So you have a list for maybe you have you have you've created maybe a list of a ten years, and uh, after the 
as far of the 10 years, the interest or the land or the interest in the land comes back to you. So that which will come back to you is what you call like the reversionary interest after the expiry of the particular period or the quantum of interest, uh, which was the subject matter of like the, 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 the list. And then D, it is a sub list. Um, no, uh, there's no law which says that uh, if you have a list in the form of a sub list, then you don't have to actually uh, satisfy the requirement of writing. No, there's nothing like that. So the answer is certainly uh, B, as uh, some of you actually uh, mentioned it. Okay, somebody has requested if I can finish the, the New Land Act. Okay, I will, I, will, I will try and push that to you. I think I have the PDF somewhere. But it's working. If, okay, you can print it once you get it. Uh, okay, so I think it's not moving. Yeah, in terms of uh, Criminal Offenses Act, 1960 Act 29, uh, what is the effect? What is the effect of mistake of fact? What is the effect of a mistake of fact? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so the person who said the answer is B, I'd like you to explain uh, your position. Some of you are very good at uh, getting all the correct answers, but I want you to explain why you've chosen those answers. So the person who put the B there, can you provide explanation? Uh, you can raise up your hand, I'll allow you to speak. Okay, Nenebi, okay. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Uh, maybe or something. Yeah, maybe yeah, you can mute yourself. Or you have changed your mind. You are no longer going for B. Okay, so let's take a back since. Yes, Bex. Okay, Doc. Um, I think that ignorance of the law is no excuse, but ignorance of mistake of fact is an excuse. As was in the case of Nyaneba and the others, where they did not know that uh, 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 my drama was prohibited, but they thought it was hurt or something like that. So I think that justifies the B as an answer. Right, thank you, uh, Bex. Yeah, so that is what I want. Uh, what type of crime? What type of crime will be classified as strict liability crime? Uh, so first of all, this is a, a strict liability crime. Before we look, okay, of course they have the the, the definitions. They're not. They haven't given a, just a list of examples of a crime. Okay, so a one with the mens rea and actus reus, uh, B, one with mens rea without actus reus, C, one with actus reus without mens rea, D, one which is regularly in nature. Yeah, so uh, strict liability offense uh, focuses on the, the actus reus and the mens rea is embedded in the actus reus. You don't need like a distinct uh, 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 menstrua, uh, you are supposed to have like a, a license because you can have like a fire uh, arm. If the weapon is found on you without the license, uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether you had any particular intention or not. You are, yes, uh, Jalen Kalan, yeah, I've allowed you, your hand has been up for some time. Jalan. Jalan Kalan, your hand has enough. Yes, I've allowed you. Yes, you can speak. Yeah, I, I wanted what you just said, where the actus reus 
the mens rea is embedded in the actus reus is, is what we mean by strict liability. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when we relate it to, uh, to uh, possessive crimes, we call it uh, like road offenses act and other stuff yeah, like that, absolutely. where you. Yes, yes absolutely. That's and then crime. Yes. Okay. That, yeah, Thank that, you. That's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, what is African peer review mechanism? Yeah, uh, self imposed compulsory review mechanism for economic growth by the African Union. Uh, not okay, European, no, European imposed directive. I mean, that, I mean, that one you have to dismiss it, it's not the European imposed. Uh, C mutually agreed self monitoring mechanism, voluntarily agreed by African Union. Uh, yeah, I think the C is the uh, C is the more uh, correct answer. Yes, uh, I think uh, Jalen, your hand is up. Yes, you are allowed. Or oh, the previous one. Okay, I'm sure the his hand is. Uh, mm. Okay, the previous one, okay, let me lower it. You know, the African peer review mechanism, uh, an attempt to do some kind of like the mutual review, you freely submit. Ghana well, I think was the second country to undergo that. They set up like a panel which will come and then audit your democratic institution processes and all that, the workings of your government, your constitutions and all that. And then they will, tell you where it's not good enough, and then we tell you where it is good enough, and some suggestions. Yeah, so that is uh, what the African peer review mechanism is about. What was the main holding in New Patriotic Party against Attorney General? The 31st December case. A, the 31st December coup was illegal, uh not not really b the celebration of the 31st december coup d'etat should not be financed out of public funds yes now that that was it uh, c that whether or not to celebrate the 31st december coup d'etat was a political question or not really d the supreme court did not have the resolution to entertain the political question yeah so uh B is the more correct uh, answer. I think uh, the main point was that, yes, that is it, that for the Zimba coup, we can celebrate it so, so long as you're not using the public funds. And I think that was like the main uh, idea. Uh, question 31 is not really, uh, it's a general knowledge question. So. It's something that you can just find out on the Google yourself, the population census of Ghana. And then of course, we are also in the population uh, census year. So you have to know uh, when the population census, uh, for example, started and then when it ended. Uh, if the, your examiner wants to test how current you are, I think that is an area that they can play around. Uh, it was the last apartheid president of South Africa. So this one sounds like a, a common uh, international uh, affairs. And that was the, 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 the FW de Clark. How many members of the current parliament of Ghana belong to the new patriotic party? Of course, this is a, an old question. So uh, the question, is not important, but you can have the same question now. So as we speak now, you have to know the composition of parliament. Uh, how many MPs belong to the new patriotic party? How many MPs belong to the new Democrat, I mean, the National Democratic Party? And sorry, National Democratic uh, Congress. And uh, how many MPs are independent? I think uh, it's important. And it's also important to know gender balance, okay? 
if your examiner happened to be a gender sensitive person, uh, he or she may also be interested in asking how many female uh, members of parliament do we have in the current uh, parliament? So I think it's something that uh, you can just look at. It's not a big deal. Yeah, these are basically very general knowledge. Who was the first Black uh, African to serve as President of the United Nations uh, General Assembly? Yeah, so I think this is a, another general knowledge question, which you can just Google it, and then you get the, the, the answer. Mm -hmm. So, a good number of you are interested in homosexuality question. So question one, the issue of homosexuality has been intensely debated in recent months. What in your opinion are the pros and cons of legalizing this particular area of human conduct? Uh, a number of articles have been written in this particular area. So what I would do is that I will put uh, about two or three or four of them to you. And then uh, you read them to get your arguments uh, organized. But I would like to remind you that we are first and foremost uh, law students, right? So when you get a question like this, you have to think as a law student and not as just an ordinary person. Because this same question can also be asked. Uh, you, know, you, can, you can ask non-law students the same question, but their responses should be different from uh, your response as a, a law student. So don't just uh, start uh, stating your emotional outbursts or whatever. Okay, you may be a Christian, you may be a Muslim, you may be a Hindu, or any other religion that you profess. But this is a, a law exam and it's a law paper. So it's not for emotional outburst. You need to structure your ideas properly. And you need to use a legal uh, uh, you know, material, legal position. And thankfully, a good number of you have done uh, jurisprudence, legal philosophy as well. So uh, assuming you had like a question like this, we have to draw on our intellectual resources from jurisprudence, from criminal law, from uh, human rights uh, law to be able to uh, develop uh, an answer. So because of the LGBTI bill, uh, which I have uh, promised to uh, do something with you about it, I will defer any uh, general or any uh, detailed discussion of this particular question until we have that uh, uh, class uh, in due course. So question two, it's been said that the ethical code of this profession as well as the law, govern imposes a dual role on the lawyer, namely client representation as well as guardian of society's interests, particularly in the fair treatment of individuals. The discouragement of conduct inconsistent with the interests of society and the maintenance of integrity of judicial process uh, Quote, Kwame Benchento, the lawyers call in Africa. What, in your opinion, should lawyers do effectively to play this role in society? Okay, so of course, you are assuming the examiner wanted to wade into the current controversy uh, going on on the legal front uh, between uh, some uh, lawyers and all that. I think uh, you have to be very mindful of, well, a question like this, in my view, uh, you haven't done legal advocacy and ethics. So 
we expect to to just answer it from just the common sense appreciation of the the right conduct ethical conduct expected of a lawyer at this stage because you are here to do uh, legal advocacy and ethics uh, as it were good so we will end here and then uh, it's just uh, 11 uh, one minute to 11 and tomorrow we will continue so uh, have a very good night